Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to briefly remind you uh, what we're doing now. Uh, last time we started discussion of light matter interaction in cavities and derived James Cummings Hamiltonian that describes the interaction between an atom and a cavity mode. And that Hamiltonian has three parts, atomic Hamiltonian, field Hamiltonian, which is just harmonic oscillator, and interaction Hamiltonian, which we obtained by putting the semi-classical interaction uh, Hamiltonian into quantum mechanical form that acts on eigenstates of the atom and eigenstates of the field. And uh, uh, in this interaction term, uh, the important part is this coupling constant, uh, which has uh, uh, several important parts. Uh, maximum value that depends inver it's inversely proportional to mode volume. Um, and it's also dependent on the position of the atom relative to the field and is dependent on the alignment between the dipole moment of the atom and the field. So this is maximized when you have atom aligned with the field and also when you have atom at the position of the maximum of electric field energy density. And of course, you can maximize G0 by minimizing mode volume. And also in the Hamiltonian itself, we have two terms. Uh, we actually have uh, emission term and absorption term, so it's Hermitian. Um, so that's all what we did last time, and then we started using this Hamiltonian to discuss different regimes of light matter interaction. So we started the analysis of the strong coupling regime when co the coupling strength, which is described by this coupling rate, uh, exceeds all the loss rates of the system. You can neglect losses, and um, we start started the discussion of this regime in the time domain, basically where you expect Rabi oscillation to occur, uh, as shown here. And later uh, today, we'll also, after we wrap up the time domain analysis and Rabi oscillation, we'll also discuss frequency domain solution for this and new eigenstates that appear in the spectrum. So for the time domain analysis, we basically just started from the James Cummings Hamiltonian and we solved time dependent Schrodinger equation um, we, to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we expanded the wave function of the system in terms of the eigenstates of the unperturbed system. So it's combination of atomic uh, states excited in ground and the field states, clock states. And when we did that expansion and we kept only two states which can be coupled by this interaction, assuming atom is resonant with the field, and we solved time dependent Schrodinger equation for the full Hamiltonian, including the interaction, we found these coefficients next to the original unperturbed eigenstates. And we found that those coefficients uh, for the system where the atom is on resonance with the field uh, would basically just oscillate. And they would oscillate with the frequency 2g square root of n plus 1, where g is the coupling constant and n is the initial number of photons in the system. So basically, if you start from the atom in the excited state and photons in the cavity, then the system would oscillate between that state and state with the ground state atom and n plus one photons in the cavity with the rate 2g square root of n plus one. Okay? And that's called Rabi oscillation. And of course, if you have zero photons initially, you also have Rabi oscillation, but you start from the excited state atom, zero photons and, to gr and ground state one atom, one photon in the cavity, and your oscillation is with the rate 2g. And that's called vacuum Rabi oscillation. So this 2g is vacuum Rabi frequency. Okay? So that's uh, basically what we did last time, and we kind of stopped here. Um, basically, if you look at the Rabi oscillation and you plot uh, magnitude squared of the coefficient uh, next to the excited state atom and n photons in the cavity, C n squared, that would give you probability that the system is in the state where atom is in the excited state and you have n photons in the cavity. And if you plot that as a function of time, you would just see oscillation with the frequency 2g square root of n plus 1. So after the full period, the atom goes exactly back into the excited state with 100% probability, and halfway through it would be 100% in the ground state. If you have losses in the system, we'll see later, maybe later today and also next week, uh, that what happens that if you start from the excited state atom and let's say zero photons in the cavity, you're not going to have this full oscillation. You never really recover atom in the excited state again. Instead, you have a damped oscillation. And this is happening because once you emit a photon, an atom goes into the ground state. That photon is in the cavity and has a finite chance of getting reabsorbed by the atom and putting atom into the excited state. But it's not 100% probability because you have cavity loss, right? So this is all damped. So you can recover atom in the excited state 
but not with 100% probability. And the number of these oscillations that you can make really depends on the ratio between the coupling strength and the loss, right? So as, you, as time goes by, the chances that photon leaves the cavity are increasing. The probability that photon left the cavity is increasing. So the probability that that photon is reabsorbed drops. Does that make sense? And of course, this matches realistic situation much more than the one that we showed before. You can also solve the Rabi oscillation in the detuned system. In the detuned system, frequency of the field is not exactly on resonance with the atom. So there may be some detuning between the atomic transition and the cavity field frequency, which we'll label as delta. And in case of detuning, without losses, plotting the same magnitude squared of CEM coefficient, which tells you, you know, probability that atom being in the excited state would look something like this. So for tuned system, it's red. For detuned system, it's blue. You see the frequency of oscillation. Rabi frequency is different as a function of detuning. You kind of can see that from the result on the right. But also the probability that if you start from the atom in the excited state, that you will exactly have the atom in the ground state and photon in the cavity is not exactly 100%. And that's because the system is detuned. So that's um, just a consequence of, of detuning and solving exactly the same Hamiltonian. Okay, so any questions about this? This was mostly a review with a little bit of more attention to the final few slides. Any questions about this? Uh, um, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so can you also do this analysis when we have very large detuning? Because I don't see where um, we use the small detuning assumption. Well, we did use small detuning de assumption when we wrote Hamiltonian initially, uh, because if you uh, had uh, small detuning, then you can make an assumption that your atoms interacts only with that one mode of the field. And uh, I mean, that, that's kind of, if you go to very large detuning, of course, your atom may be actually coupled to some other mode of the field and not exactly this one, right? So, that, okay. so, we may, so we use that assumption when we really started uh, uh, solving the problem, that we can neglect coupling of any other atomic transitions to any other modes, and this atomic transition to, to any other modes in the system. Okay, okay. then how do we, how do, we um, do the analysis if we want to see um, the system for large detuning? You can still use the analysis for small detuning. I mean, for the very small detuning uh, that we uh, looked into here, actually, this is the analysis, right? So this is, you can see that as your detuning is increasing in the system, I mean, we just plotted here the, the frequency, Rabi frequency of oscillation. I don't think I have the probability, um, yeah. So uh, there is also the, the expression for the probability of the system being in the excited state. But you can see that as your detuning is increasing and this frequency is uh, deviating more and more from the actual Rabi frequency of the unperturbed system, you will actually not have really oscillations. I mean, this uh, frequency or the probability that the system would go to ground state would not really be 100%, so you will this oscillation amplitude would be getting smaller and smaller, right? As the detuning is increased. Mm -hmm. Even if you assume that the system is not interacting with any other modes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this, from this expression, you will see that the probability is not really going between zero and one, but instead you will just, your amplitude eventually will vanish of the oscillation, but then it, also eventually you will start violating the assumptions, the initial assumptions that we made that, you know, this is the mode that really interacts with the field and nothing else interacts and atom doesn't interact with anything else. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, Go I on. Yeah. Um, sure. um, I'm just wondering the physical picture um, in the detuned system. So I can see from the equation um, in the detuned system, omega will um, or increase when you go to detuned system, and it cannot go to zero. Mm -hmm. um, I I couldn't come up with a physical picture. Uh, why? You can't come with a physical picture. Why is it? Yeah, because you, I mean, if you think about the physical picture. Um, uh, this Hamiltonian describes the interaction between the particular cavity mode and the atomic system, right? So if your atomic frequency is significantly detuned, 
I mean, the, if you have a little a bit of detuning between atomic transition and the cavity mode, since the process takes the finite amount of time, there is still a prob finite probability that the photon that you are emitting in the process uh, is kind of overlapping with the bandwidth of your cavity mode so that you can couple that photon into the cavity mode. So why, uh, for example, why the um, frequency is increasing instead of decreasing? Why is the probability? Uh, are you asking about the probability? Uh, frequency. Or the frequency is increasing? Frequency. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's technically, I mean, here it's a little bit of a change in the frequency you will have the maximum frequency of the oscillation. I mean, for a particular number, initial number of photons, when you have maximum interaction between the atom and the field, which is described with the parameter G, right? So if you are detuning your system from the cavity mode, then the interaction in some way decreases, which means that your oscillation frequency is also getting smaller and smaller. That may be a physical picture. I mean, because the oscillation fre frequency is the measure of how strong the interaction is between the atom and the field. And what is happening here is not just that the frequency is uh, um, uh, changing, but uh, also the whole um, uh, amplitude of the oscillation is, is dropping as you are, as you are uh, decreasing the interaction. It's not just one effect that is happening. I don't know if I can offer you better intuitive picture. Let me think about this. Let me think about this and I'll see it. Maybe at the break, I can offer you a better <laughs> intuitive picture, but I, yeah. I don't really have a better intuitive picture for that right now. I mean, okay. that's, uh, I think more important consequence of this is that uh, you are not really making full Rabi oscillations that this is happening because the interaction is dropping. Yeah. 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 And you know, you are not really emitting as you're decaying, you're not really emitting your photon into the, um, cavity field, you know, you're not really going to ground state by emitting a photon into the cavity field. So you're not really starting a process of Rabi oscillation. You can kind of see it as, you know, this Rabi oscillation is mm, misaligned with, you know, the oscillation for the perfect system. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll think about it. Maybe I can offer you a little bit more of the intuitive picture, but you know, that's, that's all for now. Yeah, I mean, kind of a photon that you're emitting tries to go into the cavity mode, but it cannot, right? So it kind of gets, excitation goes back into the atom over the time scales that are shorter than the time scales that it would take for the full oscillation. So yeah, let's, let's stay at that and we'll see. Maybe I can, I can think of something better. Okay, so now um, any other questions before we move on to frequency domain? Um, can I ask one more? Sure, question? sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, for uh, the last slide before that. Yeah. Um, with losses. Oh. Um, with losses. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. will talk oh, about yes. losses later today. But yes. I oh, can, okay. I, can so ask I was. Uh, I was just wondering why the probability of the system being in the ground state didn't decay because um, it, this plot shows only the probability of it being in the excited state decaying, I guess? Yeah, so you have to remember that uh, uh, we, I mean, the atom can be either in the excited or in the ground state, right? So if you're looking yes. and the probability of the atom being in the excited and ground state would be equal to one. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at the probability of the atom being in the ground state, it would be one minus this, which means that mm -hmm. as you go to, it would kind of grow, oscillate and grow, and eventually mm -hmm. it would be one for the ground state, right? Because Oh, you cannot okay. really reabsorb the photon, but instead the atom will be stuck in the ground state and atom and photon has left the cavity. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. But every time, uh, I mean, in this case, you certainly do uh, have the atom decay to the ground state and emit the photon into the cavity. It's just a matter of how long that photon stays and whether it can get reabsorbed, right? So mm -hmm. the probability of the atom being in the ground state is one minus what you see here and okay. kind of exponentially okay. grows to one uh -huh. with oscillation. Okay, any other questions? We'll talk about losses later on. All right. Okay, good. So let's move on to the frequency domain solution. 
Uh, so, so far we only talked about the time domain solution and in the time domain solution, we expanded the solution of the system in terms of the original uh, eigenstates of the imperturbed system. And then we looked at, um, we saw time dependent Schrodinger equation. But in the frequency domain, um, what we have to do is we solve for the new energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which includes interaction. And it's clear that the original eigenstates are not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian because, uh, you know, when in this case for Rabi oscillation, we initialized the system in one of the original eigenstates. It didn't really stay there. Instead, it oscillated between the two eigenstates, right? So the new, the original eigenstates are not eigenstates of the system anymore. They're just a valid bas basis that you can use to solve the problem, but they're not energy eigenstates of the system. So what are the new energy eigenstates of the system? I mean, we know eigenstates of the unperturbed Hamiltonian without the interaction. And those are basically atom in the excited state and n photons in the cavity or atom in the ground state and n plus one photon in the cavity. And energy of these two states would be just sum of the energy of the atom, atomic state, for respectively for these two is plus minus h bar nu over two. And then you have this state for the field, right? And you can represent it in this form here. Uh, if you introduce detuning between atomic frequency and the field frequency. So if you have no detuning, both of them have the same energy, h bar omega n plus one, they are degenerate. But if you have detuning, then these two states are detuned from each other by h bar delta. I mean, this is just the system without any um, interaction. So this is kind of easy to solve. You just add up energy of the atom and energy of the field. So those are the original eigenstates. Now, what are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with, with the interaction? And to solve that problem. I'm sorry. Um, no, yeah, go on. Yes. I guess the, um, why there's a plus and minus theta over two, is that the new eigenvalue? No, no, that's the energy eigenvalue of the atom, right? Uh, so atomic Hamiltonian, energy eigenvalues of the atomic part of the Hamiltonian. We picked that zero energy and we did that last time for the atom is in between ground and excited state. So ground state is minus h bar nu over two and excited state is plus h bar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the field and then the field states are, you know, for n photons and n plus one photons are having energies given here. That's harmonic oscillator. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's just our choice of zero, right? Any mm -hmm. other questions? Yeah, feel free to interrupt me. We are, yeah, this is very important too. Okay, good. So now how do we find uh, eigenstates of the whole Hamiltonian, right? And to find the eigenstates of the whole Hamiltonian, which includes interaction, what you can do is you can represent that whole Hamiltonian with interaction in the basis of the original eigenstates without interaction, and then find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. I mean, this is a typical um, approach that you would take in quantum mechanics to solve any problem. Um, and you can do that because the basis of the eigenstates of the system without interaction spans the whole space of the solutions. So you can still use that as the basis to expand new eigenstates, right? But the new eigenstates will be different. They'll be combination of these basis vectors. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Um, so it's tiny dependent perturbation theory. No, this is not perturbation theory. Uh, no, it's basically I... just solving, solving the Hamiltonian. I mean, the new Hamiltonian, you, just in, you can pick any basis to solve this problem. But for us, the most convenient basis is basis of uh, eigenstates of the atom combined with eigenstates of the field, right? For the yeah. unperturbed system. And that's EXN and GN plus one. So when you have coupling between them, we know that these new eigenstates will still be combination of atomic and field states somehow, but they're not going to be EXN and GN plus one. There'll be something else. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is just the basis, right? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, if you have three dimensional space, you can pick X, Y, Z, right? As the vectors, eigenvectors, you know, to solve some problem, or you can kind of pick another coordinate system and expand, you know, new coordinates, in terms of the original eigenvectors, but you're still spanning the same three-dimensional space. So here, the whole space that we're spanning, even when you have interaction, is this space of um, atomic states 
coupled to field states somehow, right? And for field states are Fox states, for atom, the states are ground and excited, but we don't really know what the new eigenstates are. They have to be some combinations of EXN and GN plus one, which is why to solve that Hamiltonian and its eigenstates, we're expanding it in terms of the original eigenstates EXN and GN plus one. And to express that Hamiltonian in that basis of original eigenstates, you have to find these matrix elements, which you calculate for the Hamiltonian H between states EXN and GN plus one, as shown here. And you truncate it to dimensions two by two, because going to larger dimension, you know, would mean that it's the same thing that we did last time when we talked about time domain solution. If you start with EXN, you know that it's unlikely that you can bring the system into the state G n plus five, right? It's impossible to emit five photons into the cavity mode and go from excited to ground state, which is why you don't really need to write this matrix element for any states other than EXN and G n plus one, because those are coupled by the interaction. Does that make sense? So you truncate the Hamiltonian to two by two matrix, and you calculate matrix elements between the original eigenvectors EXN and GN plus one here, okay? So when you calculate these ma matrix elements, you have EXN, GN plus one, and you know, uh, diagonal ones are symmetrically between EXN and EXN, and GN plus one, GN plus one, and then off-diagonal are cross terms, you will obtain this, okay? So if you have no interaction in the system, Hamiltonian is just atomic plus field Hamiltonian, right? How would this whole Hamiltonian look like if you turn off the interaction? Hamiltonian representing the system in the basis of eigenstates EXN and GN plus one. How would it look like? Would the cross terms go to zero? And you just Yes, exactly. So cross terms go to zero, right? Because G is zero. So you only have diagonal terms. And that makes sense, right? If whenever you represent Hamiltonian, in the basis of its own eigenstates, energy eigenstates, it would be diagonal. And you just read eigenvalues of the main diagonal, right? But if you represent Hamiltonian in another basis, not basis of energy eigenstates, you'll have off-diagonal term, okay? So this is telling you that as you increase the interaction, you start getting off-diagonal term. And that's right away telling you that these original eigenstates are not eigenstates of the new Hamiltonian. But you can still find new eigenstates by finding eigenvectors of this matrix. And by finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you will have energy eigenvalues and you will new, have new energy eigenstates, eigenvectors, in, expressed in terms of EXN and GN plus one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's exactly what we did here. When you find energy eigenvalues, I mean, you just, this is just a very simple linear algebra. When you find eigenvalues of these two by two matrix, you will find that there are two energy eigenvalues, right? Um, and they're given here. So there is H bar omega n plus one plus minus square root of H bar delta over two. Delta is detuning between atom and the field and then plus this term that depends on the coupling. So if you turn the interaction off, what are the energy eigenvalues? no interaction, right? So this term disappears, G term disappears. You just have H bar omega n plus one plus minus H bar delta over two. That's, we said that that's fine. If you have no detuning, they're degenerate. If delta is zero, then they're degenerate. They're both H bar omega n plus one, both for uh, EXN and GN plus one, right? If, they're, if there is detuning, then they're not degenerate. There is splitting of H bar delta between two of them, right? but we know that already from the solution of unperturbed Hamiltonian. But if you turn the interaction on, you are basically having new energy eigenstates. And if you for a moment neglect the tuning, these new energy eigenstates are not degenerate anymore, but instead they're split by amount which is equal to two H bar G square root of N plus one. That's for delta equal to zero. So what are the new energy eigenvalues? Energy eigenvalues you can obtain as eigenvectors of this matrix. And when you find eigenvectors of this matrix, you will find that eigenvectors would look like one, one over root two, and then 
plus minus one divided by root two. But you have to keep in mind that those coefficients are coefficients in the basis that you used for the expansion of the Hamiltonian, which is basis of Exn and Gn plus one, which means that those coefficients have to multiply Exn and Gn plus one. So the new eigenstates of the system corresponding to energy E plus and E minus are superpositions of the original eigenstates. They're Exn plus G n plus one over root two and exn minus gn plus one over root two. So this one corresponds to positive energy, this energy with the plus sign, this one corresponds to energy with the minus sign. And we call these modes even and odd mode and they're called dress states of the system. Original states are bare states, these ones are called dress states or normal modes. So when you turn the interaction on, you introduce these dress states and we'll talk more about it, uh, or there's uh, new, uh, they're also referred to sometimes as normal modes. So occurrence of the dress states is referred to as normal mode splitting for the reasons that will be obvious in a moment. Does that make sense? Right, so the frequency domain picture is very different from the time domain picture, right? Um, and before we do that, I also want to mention one more thing. I mean, these new energy eigenstates are also referred to as the entangled states of light and matter. So entanglement means, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the term of quantum mechanical entanglement, but quantum mechanical entanglement means that you cannot really factor out eigenstate of the system into product of different, you know, wave functions of, in this case, atom and wave function of field. If you can represent the wave function as the product of wave function of atom and wave function of field, then it's not entangled, right? Measurement on the atom is not telling you anything about the state of the field. But in this case, when you form these dress states of the system, they cannot be represented as product states. If you look at this, you cannot really represent this as some function corresponding to the atom times some function corresponding to the field. And if you perform measurement on the state of the atom, you right away know the state of the field without doing measurement on the state of the field. Because when you do measurement on the state of the atom and you obtain excited state as the result, you know that you had n photons in the cavity at that time. If you do measurements on the state of the atom and you see ground state, then that means that the state of the field is n plus one. And this is referred to as quantum mechanical entanglement. Of course, there are many other different entangled states of light or matter. But this one is, is entangled states of light and matter and atom, which is why people say that when you reach strong coupling regime of cavity quantum electrodynamics, you form entangled states, light, states of light and matter. You cannot really talk anymore about the states of the atom or states of the field. You can only talk about eigenstates that are entangled states of light and field. Does that make sense? Um, so we, we can know exactly the photon states uh, yeah. when when uh, only when we have a case we only uh, talk about the two level system. Um, if we have three level, then if we um, if we know even though we know we are measuring one level, mm -hmm. we still have no information on. I mean, there are ways of forming entangled states between light and matter, even if you have three atomic levels and, and field. I mean, if you have a lambda system in the atom, which interacts somehow with the field, you can form entanglement, right? I, I, here is an example. If you actually look at the papers on atom field entanglement, which people did in ions and atomic systems, there is an excited state atom and two ground states of the field uh, of the atom, right? So I talk excited state atom and two ground states of the atom, and they're roughly resonant with each other. But two transitions in that lambda system to one of the ground states and the other ground state are emitting photons in different polarizations. So when you decay from that atom, you form entangled state of light and matter, which is one ground state, horizontal polarized, horizontally polarized photon, plus the other ground state vertically polarized photon, as an example, right? But it's a, I, I'm just giving this to you as an example, explaining that you can actually have multi-levels in atom entangled to field in different configurations, but it is true that the model that we use here assume two level atom, okay? 
Okay, so what is happening? I mean, just going back to, to what we discussed so far, right? So when you start from the atom and the field and they're not interacting with each other, right? Um, eigenstates of the system are product states of the atom and the field, EXN, GN plus one, right? Um, any combination of atomic state and, and field state are allowed, okay? And if there is no detuning between atom and the field, these two, EXN, GN plus one, are degenerate and both have energy H bar omega N plus one. When you turn the interaction on here, then these two, the new energy eigenstates of the system are formed. They are combination, I mean, hybridized states of light and matter. They are EXN plus minus GN plus one over root two. And they have corresponding energies given here, which are original energies h bar omega n plus one plus minus h bar root n plus one. Okay, so there is a separation between these two new eigenstates, <clears throat> splitting of two h bar g square root of n plus one when n is the number of photons that you had. And this is called, these are called dress states and this is called splitting of the dress states. Of course, here I plotted it only for n equal, for certain n, you can draw this for any n. Right? You can draw it for n equal to zero, for n equal to one, for n equal to two, and so on. Right, So it's not only two levels that you have. Instead, you have infinitely many levels, which is why we call this dress states ladder. So if you start from the atom and the field, which are not interacting, you have two level atom, and you have harmonic ladder for the cavity mode. right? And separation is h bar omega. When you couple them strongly, the new eigenstates occur around these original eigenstates and they split by 2g square root of n plus 1. So for the first two, first manifold, first two eigenstates that are developed from atom and n equal to 0, n equal to 1 states for photon, you will have splitting of 2g, okay? The other one is 2g root 2, then 2g root 3, 2g root 4, 2g root 5, and so on. And those occur around the eigenstates h bar omega, 2h bar omega, uh, 3h bar omega, 4h bar omega, and so on. So when you look at this, it's clear that you don't have a harmonic ladder anymore. Separation between subsequent levels is not constant. It's not h bar omega. This is a harmonic ladder. This is an unharmonic ladder. Is that making sense? Because the separation between different uh, eigenstates in different manifolds changes as a function of n, square root of n. So I just plotted it for the system which is tuned, right? When atom is tuned to the cavity, delta equal to zero. So when delta equal to zero, new eigenstates are h bar omega, n plus one plus minus h bar g square root n plus one. That's what I plotted here. Right? But when the system is detuned, when you have extra detuning between the atom and the field, and you take this and plot it, it turns out that you know, this energy of the eigenstates, I mean, what we were plotting here was just a cross cut for the system which has no detuning. When you increase detuning, so does separation between the new eigenstates. It depends on delta, square root of delta squared. So you will have some curves that look like this. Right? And again, the minimum separation in the first rung in first manifold is 2G, in the second rung is 2G root 2, 2G root 3, and so on. Right? And then they, they split around that based on basically this expression. You just plot this. And this is the full ladder, right? On the horizontal axis, we plot separation, detuning between the atom and the field. Uh, this is the tuned case, and the tuned case gives you this, um, this uh, uh, energy eigenstate curves which kind of split from each other, and we call this Rabi splitting, okay? So if you have um, something like uh, a quantum dot or an atom, and we'll be talking about it, and you have a cavity mode, and you're not tuning a cavity mode, you're just tuning your quantum dot, <clears throat> changing the tuning of your quantum dot relative to the cavity mode, and if the system is strongly coupled, you will not see cavity resonance cross cavity mode resonance. Instead, you see them anti-cross, you see avoided crossing because, because you form these new energy eigenstates which are entangled states of your quantum emitter, quantum dot in the field. 
And the same thing happens in higher ranks. I mean, there are a lot of classical effects where you can see avoided crossing. And you did some of these effects when you studied coupled resonators in homework or also when Raoul was teaching. That's a completely classical effect, right? Two coupled resonators and you form bonding and anti-bonding states. And as you are detuning them, you will see something like this. It's true that normal mode splitting or anti-crossing you can see for any two coupled oscillators but you will not see these higher ranks. That's a result of quantization, okay? So the full unharmonic ladder is a result of the quantization of the field. What's the mechanism of anti-crossing or why, why they were trying to avoid? Um, because, be, uh, well, because when you are very far from the transition, where for the, from the coupling region, you have quantum dot and the field and they're not really coupled to each other. So you can talk about this branch being exactly the matter, like, you know, atom, and this branch being field. They're describing but two decoupled Hamiltonians. But when you bring them closer together, they interact. And we already showed that there are new energy eigenstates of the system, which are a combination of eigenstates of light and, and field. And their energies are exactly these energies that are given by these curves. So what I'm plotting here are eigen energies for the coupled system. That's what you will see if you measure luminescence in the system or transmission through the system. Eigen energies of the system are changing if the system is coupled. That's the solution of this Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so, so why they are trying to, uh, what is the meaning of anti-crossing? I mean, the meaning of anti-crossing is that your energy of the cup when the system is strongly coupled is not anymore h bar omega n plus one plus minus h bar delta over two, which would be a line, two lines, right? If you have no detuning, then energy is just h bar omega n plus one. They're crossing. Both, both eigenstates have the same energy, which is here. Yeah. Remove the coupling, right? Uh -huh. You have no coupling. As you're tuning your quantum dot relative to the cavity, and let's say you're not tuning cavity, <clears throat> energy of your cavity mode is not changing, and energy of the atom, since you're physically changing the distance between levels, is changing. So delta is mainly affected by changes in the atomic energy, but the total energy of the system is changing in proportion to delta, because you're tuning delta, right? but you're just adding up energy of the atom and energy of the field, okay? And depending on what effect you use to tune delta, it will be basically just a straight line, right? I mean, here, what you would have in that case is one straight line for the cavity because you are not tuning cavity resonance and the other straight line for the quantum dot because you're linearly tuning quantum dot resonance, but they're decoupled from each other which is why they cross, right? You're plotting two separate lines on the same diagram, okay? Eigenstates of the system are just basically, you know, product states of the quantum dot in the field. But when you have strongly coupled system, these lines represent new eigenstates of the system, which are entangled states of quantum dot in the field. And that's this expression that we just derived. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we're just plotting eigenstates, right? But you know, when you do experiment, that's what you would see. If you measure transmission through the cavity, you'll see Lorentzian at the resonance, cavity resonance omega naught, right? Then when you strongly couple an atom to the same cavity and you measure transmission through this, in the low power regime, you will see, instead of this single peak, you will see two peaks separated by 2G what you are seeing are eigenstates of the system. This is what you're seeing. Assuming the system is tuned onto resonance, you see these two peaks, right? Cross cut here. And of course there are additional peaks here, but you start seeing these only in the high power regime because to get here, you need multi-photon processes. For second rung, you need two photons. For third rung, you need three photons, which is why you need to crank up the power in order to see this. So when the, you have low power regime, you'll only see this. As you crank up the power, you start seeing additional peaks in here, right? In between these two peaks, which would correspond to 
higher rungs of the ladder, like second rung divided by two in frequency, third rung, and so on. And then you start populating this with two peaks for the second rung in the kind of as you crank up the power and get to two photon regime, and then the third rung, and then so on. And you know, eventually, if you crank up power a lot, then you fill up everything here. Does that make sense? So the bottom line is when you're doing experiments, you can only excite eigenstates. I mean, you're exciting eigenstates in this, of the system unless you do something special and you see energy eigenstates in transmission through the system. Okay. So we'll see some experiments and maybe that ex gives you a better idea related to the question, why do we see anti-crossing? What's anti-crossing? Okay. But those are energy eigenstates of the system. So how do we get to that strong coupling regime? Uh, well, to get to the strong coupling regime, we need to have coupling strength greater than losses of the system. And we will see the, that the actual condition is this, that coupling strength has to exceed one half of the cavity field decay rate and one half of the atom dipole decay rate. We'll see where that comes from when we start doing system with losses. But in any case, when you actually just plug in the maximum value of G and values, of kappa, which is just omega over 2q here, and you try to find the condition that that's greater than 1, you will see that the first condition depends on q factor over square root of the mode volume, because g depends on 1 over square root of the mode volume, and kappa depends on 1 over q, and the second condition depends on 1 over square root of the mode volume. So to reach these two conditions, I mean, you need to reach both conditions in order to get to the strong coupling regime. Otherwise, one of your loss rates dominates your coupling strength. What is happening is if you are violating the first condition, that would mean that the cavity photon would decay from the system before it has a chance of being reabsorbed by the atom. So there is no Rabi oscillation then, right? If you violate the second condition, that means that your uh, atom would decay to ground state by emitting a photon or phonon into something other than the cavity mode. And there is no Rabi oscillation again because it can't reabsorb the photon back from that. So you need to satisfy both conditions in order to reach strong coupling regime, which means that you need to keep Q large and mode volume small. If you only pick small mode volume, like nanometallic cavities, but your Q factor is small, you can be in the regime where you violate the first condition, meaning that losses in the cavity are too large and your photon is absorbed, lost non-radiative loss before it's reabsorbed by, the, by the, the atom. If you have a very high Q cavity, but also very large mode volume, you may get to the strong coupling regime, like the first, satisfy the first condition for strong coupling regime, but not satisfy the second one, meaning that there are a lot of other modes that your atom can couple to. Okay? So you have to satisfy both modes. And in atomic physics, often people describe these two conditions uh, in terms of critical atom and critical photon numbers, which are just combinations of these conditions. The critical photon number is just gamma, proportional to gamma over 2G, which is like our second condition. And critical atom number is 2 kappa gamma over G squared, which is a combination of, again, G being greater than kappa and G being greater than gamma. It doesn't really matter. Both of these have to be much smaller than one in order to, to get to that regime. And this critical atom number is inversely proportional to something that people refer to as a cooperativity. So cooperativity much larger than one means you're getting to strong coupling regime. This is just the matter of terminology. It's the same story. I mean, this is the actual condition for getting to strong coupling regime. What was it cooperativity? So um, could, could you like give- Oh, this is critical atom number and this is critical photon number. But this one over critical atom number is basically cooperativity. I mean, it's proportional to also per cell factor that we will discuss later. So I'm, that's why I'm not really paying too much attention to, to that now. I'm just saying that if you are in the condition when G is much greater than kappa and gamma, this is, both of these are much smaller than one. So, um, so cooperativity is larger means you, your critical atoms larger? If your cooperativity increases, your critical atom number decreases because critical atom number is proportional to one over cooperativity. Oh. Up to a multiplicative constant, yeah. Cooperativity is actually just per cell factor. Uh, but you know, when I ask you in homework to calculate the condition for the strong coupling regime, use this. 
g has to be greater than kappa half and g has to be greater than gamma half where kappa and gamma, gamma are field decay rates and it will be obvious why you have to use this. This is the most accurate one because this is the condition when new eigenstates of the system occur. This is the most restrictive condition. Okay, so let's, let's make a bit brief break and then after the break we can look into different uh, uh, experiments. Um, I'll first talk about losses and then look into the experiments and maybe that will clarify also a little bit what, what's going on here. But of course, feel free to ask questions. Uh, yeah, I just have a, a very quick question. Yeah, uh, sure. I came a little bit late, uh, but sure, no problem. the diagram before, uh, the plus and minus states, are they uh, E plus G over square root of two and E minus G? Uh, there are this, there are basically E, G, E, X, N, okay. plus minus G, N plus one, right? So okay. it's not, as opposed to the system without any coupling, you can't factor out, you know, write it as a product of E, X or G multiplied by Fox state for N or N plus one atoms. Instead, it's this kind of entangled state of atom in the field. So E X N plus minus G N plus one over root two. So that's the discussion that we had that when you measure atomic state, you right away know what the field state is based on the measurement on the atom. Okay, and then and then the minus state is E X N minus G. Exactly, exactly. But you know, you have to also keep in mind that there is the whole ladder of states, right? So when you look at this ladder here, I mean, let's look at the whole one with detuning, right? So detuning is on the horizontal axis and this is energy divided by H bar, so just frequency. So when you look at this for the tuned case, when atom is tuned to the cavity, you just, you just this, right, at zero. When you have detuning, then you move away from zero. What are the eigenstates? Well, eigenstates would be here for absence of detuning, it would be EXN plus so for the lower one, EXN minus GN plus one over root two, EXN plus GN plus one over root two, right? And here would be N equal to zero, here would be N equal to one, the next one would be N equal to two and so on. So this describes, these expressions describe all the manifolds, except that you have to go to change N, go from N equal to zero to N equal to one, N equal to two and so on. When you move away from the delta equal to zero, system. EXN and GN plus one are not equally present. There is an amplitude that depends on the detuning. I didn't really solve, it, solve the eigenstates for the tuned system. So these ones that I wrote here, they're actually exactly for tuned system. EXN plus minus GN plus one over root two. But when you have detuning, then there will be some factor that will, you know, make one state more dominant than the other. Multiplicity factor. The detuning is between uh, the like, atom in uh, the field states and the EG exactly. states. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I have a question on. Uh, yeah. I think my my main confusion on the product is the horizontal axis. There, there are three words, and I don't know which one is actually used for the horizontal axis. Yeah. Uh, on this plot that we just discussed here. No, sorry. Here? Yeah, so there are... So this, this uh, so, I mean, sorry for, for the mess here, but uh, I mean, this was taken from, from uh, one of our papers. Uh, so the, the tuning was ca uh, labeled with capital delta in units of G, right? Delta divided by G. But since we used little delta here, I also wrote like small case delta. But this is detuning. This is just detuning. So is the G the same with the G in a equation? Yes, yes. This is just oh. normalized detuning, normalized by G. I see. Because it's frequency, right? Detuning is also frequency, normalized by G. Yeah, sorry, it just shifted on the slide. But this is basically detuning. It's supposed to cover this. Delta is detuning, right? Uh, the same as the detuning that we have here in units of G, normalized by G. Yeah. So when delta is equal to zero, then that means atom coupled exactly to the cavity. I have a question about that plot as well. Sure. Uh, 
So uh, the thickness of the lines are not the same? What no. Does it yeah, and that's, a, that's an excellent question. We'll discuss losses later on. This thickness of lines is representing losses in the system. And as you go to higher manifolds, higher rungs, they increase in proportion with n, right? So, in, I mean, if let's say dominant loss in the system is cavity decay rate, which it is, I mean, you can kind of see it here a little bit. When you detune your atom or artificial atom from the cavity a lot, you see this line is narrower than this line here, right? And that's because the width of this line is just cavity Q factor determined by the cavity Q factor. And width of this line is determined by the atomic resonance, quantum dot line. And then when you are uh, coupling them to each other, then the widths of this and this are the same. Here, they're dramatically different, but when you're coupled, they're two, the two are the same because the width is combined, basically width of the cavity plus width of the atom divided by two. But then when you go to higher rungs, you multiply that by two. You lose energy faster. Yeah, so, so the width represents losses. Okay, thanks. What is the motivation of doing detuning? Um, I guess I can see um, detuning can give you some new interpretation, but in practice, when we're trying to design a de device where um, the cavity, is, is it any advantage of detuning? Yes, and I'll show you some examples actually later on uh, for, I mean, a lot of the, the ideas shown here are, have only fundamental interest, right? But now um, uh, if we did changes in detuning, it turns out that you can obtain like higher quality sources of quantum light, like single photon sources. So if you look at something that we'll discuss later on called photon blockade regime in the detuned regime, um, you can actually obtain kind of cleaner uh, single photon states. And it's related to the idea that, you know, when you are looking at this ladder, which is unharmonic for the system that's tuned, kind of these two branches are very close together. As you detuned the system, then they kind of are separated by more, right? So when you're driving one of them, you kind of have more of this unharmonicity in the detuned case than in the tuned case. Okay, we'll discuss some examples later on. I mean, maybe not today, maybe that would be on Tuesday next week. <clears throat> Photon blockade and so on, and then it will be clear. I mean, that's one application where, where detuning helps significantly. But a lot of it is just, uh, you know, I mean, fundamental uh, aspects. I mean, there are some practical applications, of course, if you have a system where atom Strong, strongly interacts with the field. You can make kind of quantum gates between the atom and the field. And, you know, you are not really losing, you're not decohering, losing energy into some other modes of the system. So you can do a lot of quantum technologies, quantum information processing, for example. Although for this particular atomic cavity QED platform, like most of the applications would be for quantum, I mean, at the moment, quantum kind of interfaces, quantum networks. So you need to entangle your atom to the field to bring it to the strong coupling regime, not to lose any information, right? Okay. Um, can I ask another question? Sure, sure, of course. Um, so in the previous slide, um, if we have very strong coupling, um, then for very high um, rungs, can the lower, um, lower level, um, I, I guess, lower level plus state and the higher level minus state, can they cross over each other? 
Oh, I, you are talking about the regime. The G is so large that you are starting basically, but that would only happen when you're coupling strength in the ultra strong coupling, when your coupling strength G is comparable to frequency of the system, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that your, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. one of your rungs is crossing the other line. I mean, yes. in yes. optical systems, you cannot really reach that because G is typically, you know, even for the strongest coupling, which was demonstrated in quantum dot cavity systems, G would be on the order of up to 40 gigahertz. And then of course your optical frequency is several orders of magnitude higher. In superconducting, uh, like circuit quantum electrodynamic systems, where you are operating at microwave frequencies, you can get to Gs that are comparable to microwave frequencies. So you can start seeing regimes where different rungs will start kind of interacting and uh, and anti-crossing each other, but not in optical range where the the their orders of magnitude different. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, could I ask one question? Yeah, on sure, of course. Yeah. Um, so, um, is, you say that it's related to N0, um, but could you like give me more intuitive picture? Um, what is what, what is what did you say? Uh, I didn't understand the question. Uh, so, you, you say that cooperativity is inversely proportional to N0? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we will talk about it. I mean, we'll talk about the weak coupling regime and we'll derive that expression. So just hold on for a while. Uh, okay. I mean, not for a while. We'll talk about it next week, right? Sure. sure. Don't worry about N0 and M0. I mean, it's just something that people in atomic physics use to describe strong coupling regime. It's not particularly, you know, relevant and people, it's uh, for, for other systems. And it just used to describe what kind of number of atoms or number of photons would be important, kind of make some changes in the system, right? But uh, uh, I, I put it on a slide in case you see it in some papers, but just use the condition that was shown previously, that G is greater than kappa half or gamma half. And we'll talk about cooperativity when we talk about weak coupling. It's basic, cooperativity is basically what we call per cell factor. Spontaneous emission rate enhancement. And as you increase it by a lot, you reach strong coupling regime. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Let's actually discuss losses before we wrap up. I mean, everything that we solved so far was in the case without any losses, right? We just solved the system without losses. We looked at the oscillation between the excited and ground states in the time domain regime or splitting of, uh, of the uh, eigenstates of the system into dress states ladder. But now the question is, uh, what about losses, right? We just assume that losses, which is cavity field decay, omega over 2q, or dipole decay, atomic decay into everything other than the cavity mode, are so small that you can neglect them, right? But in reality, that's not always the case. And I wrote to you that uh, the uh, condition for reaching the strong coupling is that this coupling strength G has to be greater than kappa half and greater than gamma half, right? And, and when I write G, it's actual G that you have in James Cummings homotomy is the same G that depends on one over square root of the mode volume. And since G increases by decreasing mode volume and kappa decreases by increasing Q, that clearly tells you that you have to increase Q and to reduce mode volume to reach this condition. You know, in most systems, I mean, so solid state systems in particular, uh, these dipole decay, I mean, you generally work with emitters that are very narrow. It's the first condition, G greater than kappa half, is the one that you have to reach. And once you reach that condition, the other one is automatically satisfied. Because the atom limit or the quantum dot limit is much narrower than the cavity limit. Right? So you have to overcome losses of the cavity before you can reach strong coupling. Right? In some atomic systems, <clears throat> it may happen that cavity is super high Q and the atomic limit is the dominant condition. But that never happens in solid state systems. Okay, so you have to make both of them uh, larger. And as I said here in quantum dot systems, or I mean, quantum dot actually is the uh, based systems are the only solid state systems uh, with which strong coupling regime has been reached at optical frequencies. I don't include circuit QED, which is with, uh, you know, artificial Josephson junctions uh, and superconductors where you kind of build up artificial atoms at microwave frequencies. That, of course, has been reached in even ultra strong coupling, but at optical frequencies, it's only been reached with quantum dots. And for, I'll show you a bunch of examples 
from quantum dots is uh, examples of strong coupling, of course, because there are no examples with other solid state systems <clears throat> and single emitters. But for quantum dots, uh, G is greater than kappa half when you reach strong coupling, and it's pretty much always much greater than gamma atomic dipole decay, right? So you don't really care about this other condition. You care about making cavity Q high. Okay, so how do, where does this condition come from, right? I mean, I told you, okay, coupling strength has to exceed losses, but why exactly kappa half and gamma half, right? Where is that coming from, okay? <clears throat> and in reality, you know, in different literature, you can see different versions of this. Of course, if G is greater than kappa and G is greater than gamma, you're also in strong coupling, right? But this is the actual condition which comes from the fact when you start seeing new eigenstates in the system. And we'll see where that comes from now. So we'll go back to our James Cummings Hamiltonian, right? We found that energy eigenstates for the system when there is coupling are given by this expression. And here I'm just uh, writing eigenstates for n equal to zero, right? So which means, you start from initialized atom and no photons in the cavity, first rung, right? First rung is n equal to zero. Of course, that's the, the one where it's hardest to reach strong coupling, right? And that's the, the most interesting one also because you usually want to interact with a single photon and map the state of the atom to the state of the single photon. So that, that's why we're focusing on this one and deriving the condition for that one. And the condition for that one is the condition here, right? <clears throat> and if you're strongly coupled with kind of in the vacuum state, uh, with vac atom in the vacuum state, you'll be strongly coupled with 10 larger number of photons as well. Of course, that's much easier to achieve. So uh, this is the, the energy eigenstates, right? H bar omega plus minus H bar G. And if there is the tuning, there is this extra factor. And here, uh, when writing this expression, we assumed and issue, I think I asked the question at the beginning, why minus h bar nu over two and plus h bar nu over two for atom, we assume that zero state, zero energy for the atom is in between excited and ground state. That's how we started writing the Hamiltonian for the atom. And also, of course, field is in, has energy eigenstates of the, which are Fox states. So zero ground state or vacuum state would correspond to energy h, h bar omega over two, right? So for atom, ground state is minus h bar nu over two, and for field, ground state is h bar omega over two, and that's how we derive this expression. Now I will just shift both of them to zero, and the reason why I'm shifting them both to zero, meaning kind of translating energy, subtracting um, uh, from the field energy h bar omega over two, and for the atom, I'm adding energy plus h bar nu over two. I'm doing that just to obtain the expression that you will see most as the one mostly used in literature. This is not really anything new, it's just kind of translating zero energy level to different position in the system. So if you do that, then you kind of go back to what we already derived for the system. And for field, you know, you have to subtract omega over two, and for atom, you also have to add plus nu over two, right? <clears throat> and when you do all of that, you actually obtain the expression given here, okay? I mean, it's the same thing. It's just translated a little bit. So I, of course, didn't include losses yet, right? I'm just doing this so that I, I can obtain the expression that you'll see uh, kind of repeated in all the literature. Uh, so now the question is what, what happens when you have losses? And when you have losses in the system, of course, you can treat the problem accurately. And we'll discuss that a little bit later where you can, you know, instead of solving James Cummings Hamiltonian, which describes only one atom coupled to one mode and interaction in between, you can introduce other lost channels and treat the interaction with those lost channels. And that would be other modes of the field, like free space modes where photons can leak or, you know, where atom can directly decay. And you can solve Hamiltonian that has a lot more channels and we'll be doing something like that for weak coupling regime. But there is a very, very simple way to seeing, you know, obtaining the condition for strong coupling, which is kind of semi-classical treatment of the, um, of the system. Meaning we start from these eigenenergies for the coupled system and then introduce the loss by introducing imaginary part of the eigenfrequencies of atom and field. So if your atom, has the line bit, I mean, of uh, uh, or atomic decay rate of gamma, then you will introduce imaginary part of the eigenfrequencies of the atom. 
And if your cavity mode has cavity field decay rate of kappa, then you just write the cavity field frequency with an imaginary term I kappa. Okay, and that's of course semi-classical treatment. I'm just introducing loss, broadening by introducing an imaginary frequency. Okay. So if you take that right. and keep in mind, these are cavity field decay rates. This is omega over two Q, and this is basically half line bit of the atom. Okay. Yeah, question? There was a question. Uh, why is a semi-classical approach? Is it a more rigorous approach? Yes, absolutely. There are much more rigorous approaches where you just add the extra, I mean, the most accurate rigorous approach would be just adding all the terms into Hamiltonian. And we'll do something similar for, you know, big coupling regime. For example, if your dominant loss in the system is coupling of your cavity field to other like free space modes, which leads to finite Q factor, then you start from James Cummings Hamiltonian and you add free space modes and you add the interaction of your cavity field with free space modes. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's the most accurate way. And we'll do a little bit of that later, but of course that's kind of more complicated than this. So we're starting with the simplest picture, which people use 99% of the time for at least finding the condition, um, you know, on what's going on in the system and when you which strong coupling. So when you introduce this imaginary part of the frequencies, you know, losses, then you go back to <clears throat> energy eigenstates and plug these back in, you know, just plug in complex frequencies and rearrange, and this is the expression that you would obtain, okay? And actually this expression covers both strong and weak coupling regimes. And you can see this expression often in the literature. That's the expression that I, I you know, wanted to derive. And that's also why I kind of shifted zero energies for atom in the field so that you have it in exactly the same form that people usually use. So what, what do we see from here, right? I mean, again, this is semi-classical treatment. This expression can give you some weird conclusions that are inaccurate, which we'll discuss later on. But in most cases, it's useful to figuring out what, what happens in the system. So let's look at the condition. I mean, this is the expression that we derived. When coupling strand G is greater than cavity field decay rate, actually greater than kappa half, where kappa is cavity field decay rate. And this is much, much greater than the atomic dipole decay rate. And we assume that we tune atom on the cavity resonance. So atomic line bit is the smallest in the system. This is what we call good emitter because cavity is worse than emitter. And this is what we would have for quantum dots, for example, right? Very narrow line bit, but cavity is broader and we have to make coupling strength larger than the cavity line bit, okay? So if this condition happens, what happens with this expression? Delta equal to zero, okay? Gamma, you can neglect because it's much smaller than kappa. And here under square root, we have G squared, right? Minus kappa squared over four, okay? This thing here. And then here, of course, I neglect gamma, so I have kappa over half, kappa over two. So what is this? And of course, since omega is equal to nu, then omega plus nu over two is just omega. So we see that eigenfrequencies of the system are given by this expression. So what do we have here? We have two real, um, I mean, frequencies, omega plus minus square root of g squared minus kappa squared over four. And then this here is a decay, right? In, again, imaginary part of the new eigenfrequencies. So what would you see if you measure transmission through the system? I mean, for a moment, let's assume that G is much, much greater than kappa half, right? If G is much, much greater than kappa half, you will see omega plus minus G, which is the first rung, right? And they'll be broadened by kappa, cavity field decay rate, right? But to see these two frequencies, what condition have you have to satisfy? Well, G has to be greater than kappa over two. Yeah. Right. If G is not greater than kappa over two, then this just gives you another imaginary term, which is just line bit. I mean, you just have peaks at omega, but their broadening is influenced by, by G and kappa. And that's weak coupling regime that we'll analyze later. So, so one thing that I'd like to point out is, because this is a semi-classical treatment, it has limitations. You can derive some conclusions that are not physical. And one conclusion that people sometimes derive, which is not physical, is that if, if I have arbitrary losses in the system, 
kappa and gamma, but they are equal to each other. Then kappa equal to gamma, you know, I cancel this out and I have strongly coupled system always. That's not true, right? I mean, this is just because this expression doesn't capture all the physics. If you solve the full Hamiltonian, that will never happen. And physically, it doesn't make sense. G has to be greater than all the individual loss roots. Because if you think about the system, if kappa is greater than G, right? That means you emit a photon and photon just leaves the cavity. You can never reabsorb it back, right? So if kappa is equal to gamma, but they're much greater than G, then you either lose the photon from the, through the cavity mode or you lose it directly to some non-radiative root or, or another you know, mode. Does that make sense? So just don't, don't trust this expression completely, right? I mean, it's fine in the regimes that we're analyzing here and gives you accurate answers, but don't dissect it completely and draw conclusions that you always reach strong coupling regimes because somehow losses can cancel each other. That's not true, right? <clears throat> It's not possible to balance one loss with another loss. Okay, so you know that's exactly what we did before, right? So you know, instead of having a cavity resonance, you have splitting into two peaks. They are separated by two g. If g is much greater than kappa half, actually, in reality, they won't be exactly separated by two g. I mean, this expression tells us that they'll be a little bit closer than two g if system has losses, right? And separation would be two g two square root of g squared minus kappa squared over four, right? So they're a little bit closer, right? Because of the loss, but line width of both of them, you know, would be determined, would be kappa basically, right? Given by the, the cavity field decay rate. And, and line width of both of them, which is important remember, cap, kappa is the cavity field decay rate. So when you log, plot the power spectrum, line width of each sub peak would be kappa, but for the cavity itself, line width is two kappa. Okay, so these two new eigenstates have half width of the cavity, and in the second round, they'll have the full width of the cavity and then go on, it increases more and more. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, you know, what we already discussed, and then we'll, you know, see that from the same expression, we can also analyze weak coupling regime when kappa or gamma is much greater than G. Okay, any questions? So what yeah, go on. Sorry. Um, why do you have to do this analysis with delta equal to zero? You don't have to. I mean, you oh, can okay. do it for, for, you can actually do it for delta, you know, non-zero, but I did it because for delta equal to zero, you directly see this condition g greater than cup over two, which we wrote for the system on resonance. And, you know, you kind of have these two symmetric peaks. When delta is not zero, then you still see splitting, but these two peaks will not really be symmetric. You know, that's because one would be more kind of cavity-like, the other would be more atom-like, and we'll see actual experiments. What happens is you tune the system, only when the system has delta detuning zero, you have two symmetric peaks. And then kind of they are still splitting, but they're, you know, kind of becoming asymmetric. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I also have a question. Like, uh... Yeah, sure. Why did we have to assume the ground state for field and the atom to be zero at the beginning of this? No, we, we totally didn't have to do that. I just wanted to put the expression in the form that you'll see if you actually take, you know, 90% of the cavity QED papers, you'll see this expression, but written in exactly this form. If I didn't shift the energy of the atom and the field, I mean, you have the same result, but here you will not have omega plus nu over two. Instead, you will have, you know, just, you know, different expression. You actually, you will have to shift it to, to original eigenstate of the atom and the cavity. Yeah, you will okay. see this, right? Instead of this, seeing this average energy over the atom and the field, you'll see something that looks more like this. Okay. Okay. Right. So I just want you to put it in the form that you'll see in literature. It doesn't really mean anything physically. Okay, so uh, just, just we're almost at the end, so we'll not really go further, but what we will be doing, you know, next time, uh, I'll just prepare for that, is uh, we'll go through a lot of examples of strong coupling with uh, single semiconductor quantum dot in the Marcin quantum dot in a photonic crystal cavity. 
<clears throat> and that's again the only regime where with a single quantum emitter in a cavity in optical frequency regime people have rich strong coupling so it's easy to show a lot of effects that we discussed here and we'll see actual experimental data and dress states ladder and talk about photon blockade and a lot of other effects that are interesting <clears throat> and you know this this platform has been used a lot for studies of solid state cavity qed of course Circuit QED platform with, at microwave frequencies has been used a lot, and there you can reach much stronger coupling, but you work with microwaves, right? So here you can generate non-classical states of light, which are optical photons, and then with circuit QED platform, there are microwave photons. And then people have done, of course, a lot of work with atoms coupled to cavities, strongly coupled to cavities, but you know that's a neutral atom platform. It's not solid state platform. So we'll kind of focus on this one uh, and uh, go through all of different examples uh, of the experiments that we did discuss before. And then we'll we'll this after that we'll discuss weak coupling regime, which you can kind of also analyze from this expression, but also you can analyze it more accurately. And that would be the regime when you know, kappa or, or gamma dominates over G. And you can kind of already see what's going on in that case, right? There are no real frequencies appearing, but just changes in imaginary term, which is just loss, right? You're changing decay rates. Okay, if there are no more questions, then maybe we can wrap up for today and I'll see you folks on Tuesday. Okay, thank you folks, bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you, see you, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you.